Hi, I'm Jeff Davis of the Napa Valley Wine Library Association with this Books on Wine evening with author Robert Camuto, who just released a book in October called South of Somewhere, Wine, Food, and Soul of Italy. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to see you. It's kind of interesting to have read your book the last week and a half, and now I get to sit here and talk to you about it. Yeah. And not many people get that opportunity. Great. You've had quite a busy schedule since you've been here in California the last couple of weeks, haven't you? Yes, that's true. You want to share some of the details about where you've been? Well, um, as far as the book goes, uh, I've been um, uh, all over from uh, L.A., San Francisco, Sonoma, uh, and now Napa. Uh, reading, having dinners, <laughs> and... Uh, I've had a great time. It's been, uh, I lived in California, in the Bay Area, about 40 years ago. So I guess I could say back in the day. And uh, it's been really interesting also visiting uh, young winemakers here mm -hmm. who are working with um, uh, uh, native Italian varieties in different wine countries. And it's really interesting because I think uh, on both sides of the ocean, there's generational change happening in wine. And to me, that's really exciting. I mean, it's happening in Italy. It's happening in the south of Italy. I think it's happening in California as well. And, um, you know, sometimes it's very small realities of young people trying to do something a little different than the previous generation, a little more precise, follow their own vision. So that's been pretty exciting for me. I was going to say, even though your book's about Italian wine and specifically the southern regions, um, you are a contributor to Wine Spectator. True. They have offices here in, in Napa. Yeah. And. Um, have you had a chance to swing by and see your old cronies over there? Yes, yes, we did today. We did today in the uh, uh, in downtown Napa. <laughs> so it's, some, you're certainly a worthy candidate for a Napa Valley Wine Library interview. Absolutely, like, yeah. absolutely. Before we get on to your book, uh, South of Somewhere, tell us a little bit about your history as a, a journalist. Ah, uh, that's a long one. No. Uh, when uh, I got out of college, I moved to California because I grew up in New York, so the dream was to you know, live in the land of you know, milk and honey, right? You know, uh, California, sunshine, um, it may get hot, but at least you don't have to shovel it. Um, <laughs> although San Francisco is pretty cold. But um, you know, back in the day, uh, back in the day, um, I worked for several publications and even, even did a little, little work for the San Francisco Chronicle, Bay Guardian, you know, in, you know, book reviews, music, cultural kind of things. And um, uh, I worked for a magazine called Boulevards. I interviewed the poet uh, Charles Bukowski, mm -hmm. very extensive uh, cover story I did on him, which was a uh, great experience. But uh, after I, I went back to the East Coast, uh, graduated from um, Columbia with my master's in journalism and then went to Texas where I worked in um, newspapers for some time. I mean, it was booming in the early 80s, you know, what can I say? And, uh, you know, there was just a lot of opportunity there, you know, to cover. Um, and I worked for the Dallas Times Herald, which was a great paper where we had the yeah, likes of Molly Ivins working there. Um, and uh, then in the 90s, I started uh, my own um, alternative weekly newspaper in Fort Worth, Texas, believe it or not. It was the largest market in the country, a million people that did not have one. Oh. And um, after five years, I sold that. It, it is still uh, pr publishing. What's it called? Uh, FW Weekly or Fort Worth Weekly. Oh, good uh, for you. Still publishing, you yeah. know, we covered, you know, the. Uh, did a little rabble rousing and uh, music and arts, that kind of thing. And uh, so after that, you know, after 15 years in Texas and uh, having a child there, uh, my wife and I decided to move to her uh, where she was born. She grew up in California, considers herself Californian. But we moved to Nice, France, where, uh, in, in that area where she was born. And then, 
You know, I just find myself constantly drawn to Italy. I mean, as far as the reporting, as far as the wines, as far as what's happening there now, I mean, uh, France kind of went through a, uh, I'd say sort of a renaissance maybe 20 years ago in picking out its terroir. And, you know, that's something that's really been happening in, in, in Italy and southern Italy after that. So for the last six years, um, I should, we should say that you were in France for 15 years. 15 years the there. Short stop. It was quite a while. That's kind of my time span. And then now it's only been six years in Italy, uh, in Verona. It's in the north. It's a humorous story. His wife is French, even though they met here in the States, right? Yeah. Um, so when he proposed the idea of moving to Italy, she had to think about it for a while and said, well, OK, as long as we're not living south of Rome. Yeah, Rome and south was not possible. <laughs> so, and I'm kind of, you know, I guess that's fine with me. You know, as people in Rome say, in one day or in one morning, you can go to the post office, you can go to the bank, but you can't do both. So uh, it is nice living in a more you know, uh, a very accessible place, you know, 90 minutes from Florence by train, one hour to Venice. So it's super. The, the, the train system is, has been a super nice. pleasant surprise. We should touch upon your uh, previous books. The one when you were in France, you wrote Corkscrewed, Adventures in the New French Wine Country. Mm -hmm. And then Palmento, a Sicilian wine odyssey. So yeah. Your first venture into the south yeah. of Italy. Yeah. South Italy. And in all of them, I've kind of covered the small producers, new generation, um, new ideas, with the kind of idea of wine as more than a business, but as a passion about something that's in people's blood, this kind of imperative, and in Italy, you know, where it really becomes an intergenerational family story. And it really is a part of that culture. That, uh, and you're familiar with that because your family's from Naples region. Yes, yes, from a little town called Vico Equenze. We didn't have any winemakers in my family, <laughs> except for my grandma father, who from that town, who had a, uh, he had a Ralph's Deli in New York on First Avenue, uh, you know, many, many years ago. And uh, before I came along, uh, you know, he used to make wine uh, in the basement in the cellar of the store with grapes that came from California. You know, because uh, many Italian immigrants, I think it was a tradition that, uh, you know, came out of prohibition, that they made their, you know, they had to make their own wine because, uh, you know, you couldn't buy it. And uh, I think for many Italians, you know, you can't have a meal without wine. Wine is not really a drink as, you know, we, often think of it today, but it was, you know, a food that was part of the meal. So, you know, he made his wine and, you know, uh, my mom always used to say, he always said, if the grapes are good, the wine is good. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when the truck came in, if the grapes were good, his wine was good. And, uh, you know, like many Italian families, that's what wine was. You made your... Where's the grub come in? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, as one of the characters in my book says, Elena Fucci's dad, uh, in that passage I read the other night in uh -huh. Sonoma, he said, you know, wine, you know, he goes, wine was not this. You know, that people did that. They were, they were paid, um, you know, a liter of olive oil a day. And in that part of Italy, actually, he said, you know, the previous generations, they planted their grapes and they starved. Uh, but now, uh, what's exciting to me is you, you have young people like his daughter, who's the granddaughter of sharecroppers, who can work the land in a smart way, you know, who went off to get her enology degree, comes back, and is able to produce and market this to um, you know, people of her generation that love her wines, whether they're in um, uh, the West Coast, New York, or London, and, mm -hmm. or the north of Italy. So 
that's what's exciting today because I think with a little bit of, um, uh, you know, a little bit of technology and know-how, you can make great wines. Um, Luigi Veronelli, the uh, Italian wine critic, once said, the French have silver grapes and make golden wine. And we, the Italians, have golden grapes. I mean, they have everything you need. You don't have to, you know, you put the, you know, but we make silver wines. And I think now, we, hmm. you know, a, a little bit of common sense, know-how, and, uh, you know, some technology to be able to protect things from air when you want or cool. Um, you know, this new generation is really uh, valorizing what they have. So you had the chance when you were 10 years old to go back and meet your extended family. Yes. And, uh, I like you say uh, you swam in the Mediterranean with your cousins, you ate well, you uh, wrote, uh, and, and after that event you said that summer you fell in love with a way of living. Yes, and That's what yes. pushes you and inspires you to this day is to cover y that. Yeah, when I was um, uh, 10, I went to Vico Equenza. It was 1968, so I call that my summer of love. But uh, unlike the summer of love in San Francisco, there was no sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I was 10, you know, so it was a uh, gelato, pizza, and uh, you know, swimming in the Mediterranean. With the, and you know, I discovered also all the the, the scents of the Mediterranean, the smells of, you know, even the smells of the dust you know, between the herbs and under the olive trees and... Um, That's and, stuck with uh, it. Yeah, yeah, the fig trees, the, the mocha pot on an ant stove as she's... Wow. And those little breads that are, um, you know, seasoned with orange water and those kind of things and... Uh, um. There's a common theme in your book, and that's how the struggles continue in southern Italy, and yet there's a renaissance, as you mentioned, going on in the wine industry. Uh, but you have aging winemakers who are resistant to change, and yet there's the new, newer, younger generation that goes off and maybe learns more uh, from elsewhere, and even France, and comes back. However, then there are the, the generation that leaves the small towns and doesn't come back, which uh, leads to some of these uh, communities dying. So it's a, it's a real interesting juxtaposition about what's going yeah, on there. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I mean, emigration has been the big, you know, big tragedy of the Italian countryside. And the average age of the, you know, some of these contadino is uh, getting up there. So it is great when you can see, you know, the only way for, for, for people to make a living is um, to be able to make a living. I mean, you know, and a lot of it just has to do with bottle prices. And I'm not talking, you know, three hundred uh, dollars. You know, I'm talking ten or fifteen or mm. you know twenty. So I think you know that's what's really key because uh, you know for so long. Um, you know, these Italian producers, they had to sell to the big winery. You know, that's all they could do. And it was the big wineries or cooperatives that set the price. And sometimes, I mean, I've heard time after time in Campania, I mean, they make, they, it's a great area for, for example, Tarazzi. You know, uh, many of the producers who are pushed to make their own wine said, you know, I just couldn't give my grapes away anymore. Mm. You know, which is what they were doing when you add up all the costs and you know, all this backbreaking work, they were just giving their grapes away to the big producers. So, mm. you know, you have more brands, more competition, more, and then, you know, some of those are, you know, rising to the top. And I think you have movements of young people uh, that uh, also layered on that who are the first generation saying, okay, let's not, um, let's not sell our grapes anymore. Let's, uh, or let's not also sell in bulk because that would be the next phase. People would make wine, but they sell it in sfuso, you know, for, uh, you know, people who come around and, uh, 
you know, with their gallon jugs. Right. One of the producers in my book uh, was from Lazio. He's a young guy uh, in his 40s, and when he was a kid, he would go with his dad he, uh, in his truck. They would drive to Rome, and he is like, you know, eight years old, would have a pack on his back filled with wine. And they'd go from door to door and go, Psh, you know, with the local Cesanese. And, um, you know, he was saying Romans were so against the idea of Cesanese because that was their common wine, and Romans are very snobbish. They're like, oh, we can get anything. You know, we were the, you know, we were the center of the world 2,000 years ago, so we want wine. champagne, we can have champagne. Why would we drink, you know, the local wine? So uh, he was selling his wine in like a farmer's market for like, you know, the equivalent to five euros a bottle next to the stand that sold the, you know, the prosciutto and the cheese. And finally he picked up, took his wines to, uh, you know, Northern Europe. I, I, it was either like Norway or the Netherlands. And people were like, wow, this is great wine. Okay, <laughs> we'll buy it. And now he's come back and, you know, he's at the, you know, he's a, like a kind of a local star winemaker. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing I loved about Robert's book is it's so easy to read and it just captures you. It's the way he discusses and describes the settings and the conversations that he has with these family members. And it just it goes seamlessly, seamlessly from one region to the next, to the next, and to the next family and so on. And uh, it's, it's a real page turner. I hate to use the cliche. And as I mentioned, though, I was on a tablet, so it was more of a page flipper. But uh, there's one part that I'd like to mention again, if you don't mind, the Elia. Um, Emilio Pepe. Yes. Um, speaking of the, the family battles, uh, in the chapter Three Gentlemen of Abruzzo, uh, the relationship between Emilio Pepe and his daughters, Sofia, Daniela, and his granddaughter, Chiara. Uh, now, Emilio didn't have any brothers. He got married, had three daughters, no sons. So he, he's an older man now who's having to do all the work himself. He has to get out there and drive the tractor and, and, and even... And he likes to complain about that too. He says, if I had a son, I wouldn't have to do all this work. And they're all like, oh, Papa, we love you. He's like 90, whatever. <laughs> so his Montepulciano de Abruzzo sells across the globe. Uh, he's had a 65th vintage when you were with him, um, but he's still old school. He stomps his white grapes by, by foot he um, does not use oak barrels. He won't use stainless steel. He stubbornly continues to destem his red grapes by hand for every vintage. Um, but yeah, they have this sort of grate, and they just push him over like that. And he's like, no, no, the machines, they'll break the stems, and it creates bitterness. I don't, you know. He's really good. He's <laughs> but he, this is one example where his oldest daughter went off to Bordeaux to get a, a master's degree in wine management. And she came back to work with her father and kind of help him, I mean, even though he was somewhat successful, to get a leg up on, on his process. And uh, she returned home to help and eventually quit because her father said, You're, you found his wine to be unrecognizable. So. She ended up leaving, but the other two daughters just have stuck around to help out a little bit. Yes. Um, but it's yeah, the, he's the, a great character. This book is full of stories like that. are just so interesting. Did you want to read a passage right now? Yes, yes. I was going to read a, path, uh, uh, a passage. I'm sure uh, many folks have heard about the sort of renaissance on Mount Etna. Uh, and I document that in my second book, Palmento, uh, quite extensively. Um, prior to, and I think it's a good example for Italy and Southern Italy because prior to 2000, I mean, the, 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 wine, the red wines that were being sold on Etna were sold in like bottles that looked like flowing lava, you know, for tourists who went there. It was all awful. And, but it was really the confluence of a number of key people that came on the mountain at the right time that saw what these grapes had, this Norello Mascalese, and uh, that really created a scene, and they started talking, and now, I mean, Etna wines are very uh, prized, and the qualities, and the qualities great as well. They also have white wines, Caraconti, you know, can be a, a, an amazing, amazing 
um, white variety. And there's some of that actually being grown on, uh, in, uh, on the Sonoma Coast now by this project Eris that's a project between this uh, producer Salvo Foti and um, the owner of uh, Rice or Reese Vineyards. Mm. So um, I wanted to read a passage about uh, this man by the name of uh, Andrea Franchetti, who is one of the most eccentric wine characters I've ever known. He grew up in Rome of La Dolce Vita in the 60s. And uh, when I once asked him, he, he said at 16 he quit school because he wanted to, uh, uh, he was going to uh, hitchhike to Afghanistan. And I said, wow. why Afghanistan? And he said, because all the hippies were going to India. So anyway, he's a crazy guy, but was part of that scene. He'd been very successful in Tuscany with wine before that. Um, and um, he passed away this year. So I thought I'd read a passage uh, uh, okay. from Andre. Right. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going back at a time when it's, uh, uh, they have an annual event called the Contrada dell'Etna, you know, where all the producers get together, they pour their wines, you know, that kind of drill. <clears throat> that morning outside Rondazzo, Andrea Franchetti stood erect in front of Castello Romeo, a pink turreted and fresco 18th century confection of a Marquis Palazzo that looked like it could have once hosted balls out of Sicily's literary Bible. De Lampedusa's The Leopard. A great lawn ended in a pair of tall palms and the villa's double staircase arrayed on the grass, oh, uh, and the double staircase, arrayed on the grass were open white shade tents under which more than 100 Etna producers poured their wines for a few thousand people who arrived in waves. At nearly 69, Franchetti's features had softened. He still looked like a faded movie star with dark tortoiseshell sunglasses balanced on his Roman nose, his thick wave of slightly askew brown hair combed over his brow, and a seersucket jacket covering his broad frame. Franchetti was one of the first stranieri to have stumbled upon Etna in the 2000s, after first stumbling into winemaking in Tuscany. He was the maestro who created this event, and he and his boyish grin were in their element. Etna was nowhere 10, 11 years ago, he said. Now producers come from northern Italy to see what's going on, and some of them start making wine here. I ask myself why. We continued the conversation one morning later that week in his more or less renovated Paso Pichara winery. Etna is pristine, Franchetti began. It lends itself to emotion. Wearing a moth-eaten sport jacket, he sat slouched on an old leather sofa. He growled his words carefully, like chords in a jazz composition. And people are not stuck up. You see, the new young sommelier who really sell the wine in Italy, they don't want to be involved in the academy. They want to come to a place that's fun. They have tattoos and a lot of power. Franchetti has a knack for obliquely riffing on subjects, trying out words and seemingly unassociated memories and ideas until he arrives at a linguistic pearl charged with greater meaning than what he set out to say. Wine used to be for the knowledgeable and erudite, he mused. James Bond ordered Chateau Lafitte, so you, shoot off, so you showed off your new stuff. Franchetti has led the life of a novelistic character, beginning with his happenstance birth in New York, where his mother, the expat heiress to the Ca South Carolina Millican textile fortune, <laughs> traveled so as to have her child in an American hospital. Hmm. His father was an Italian baron from one of the rare Jewish families admitted to the Italian aristocracy in the 19th century. Franchetti, Franchetti grew up among parties and the art world of 1960s Rome. One uncle was a leading modern gallerist, another by marriage, was the American expat artist Cy Twombly. Franchetti, Franchetti quit high school, bicycled and hitchhiked his way to Afghanistan, 
wrote some ma magazine articles, and played bit parts in Italian low-budget noir films. But for the most part, he led a prolonged, drug-fueled adolescence until the age of 32, when he decided to put on a tie and travel to New York to import Italian wine. Six years later, he returned to Rome to marry and start a family with his old girlfriend, a Sicilian aristocrat who had served years in prison for activities as a student radical during a violent period of Italy's Red Brigades. Franchetti had once sold a Twombly painting and used the proceeds to buy land and a ruined house in Tuscany's Val d'Orcia. In the winter of 1990, he left his family in Rome for a weekend of solace in the country and never went back. Knowing nothing about agriculture, he launched Tenuto di Tenoro, inspired by Bordeaux's Maverick Garagis and their thick, dark wines. Franchetti created his own limited edition wines based on Cabernet Franc. While vacationing on Sicily, he nosed around for a place to make wine and arrived on Etna because of the cooler, high-altitude climbs. The Etna, he explained, is all about moving away from the heat because we are in Sicily. The wines he tasted there were rough, rustic, and still fizzing in the bottle. And of course, Franchetti wasn't content to only work with Norello. For his signature wine, called simply Franchetti, he planted an intimate terraced amphitheater near his winery with an odd couple grape pairing. Bordeaux's inky late ripening blending Petit Bordeaux alongside Lazio's Cesanesi di Affile, a subvariety of the workhorse grape that fueled Roman Trattoria House Reds. When I first met Franchetti, he looked down on Norello, which produced thin and pale wines compared to the ripe Bordeaux he loved. For his first Norello vintage in Etna 2001, he admitted to illegally smuggling in a barrel of his best Tuscan Merlot to toss into the blend. Franchetti eventually made peace with Norello, though by that time he'd stopped drinking altogether. Now Franchetti sampled wines by sniffing, observing, and tasting, and spitting. It was late morning, and the sun hit the courtyard out the window, lighting it white as swallows darted between his farm buildings. Reflecting back on the changes on Etna, Franchetti said there was still a lot of mediocre wine being produced here. But more than the changes to wine, he seemed fascinated by the social changes, specifically in a new generation that had come of age in the last decade. There's a new thing going on where the kids sit outside the bar and, of course, look at the girls going by. But now they not only look at the girls, but they swirl the wine and use imper important words like primer and cru. Franchetti's mood brightened. You have these kids saying things like, this 2012 is really Etna. That, he said, is terroir. It's like Bordeaux. There's enough money on the mountain that they don't have to go to Milan or Paris or London. They can stay here and make a living. He sat up now, looking as though he'd shed the weight of his years. People don't seem to emigrate from here anymore. They don't need to emigrate from here anymore. It's a place that has been saved because of wine. That's great to hear. Yeah, very good. His uh, writing is not only colorful with the describing scenes, but as I mentioned, the characters in the book are just so outrageous, some of them. This was, you said he was kind of a crazy guy, but that passage yeah. was pretty calm, but uh, there's uh, Giuseppe, and there's actually a section called, Thus Spoke Giuseppe. Giovanni, Paolo and Elena, Stefano, Stefano and Mary Angela, Vincenzo, Melissa and Andrea and your family members, the Coffees, are all covered in this book. And the way, and again, it's the way he presents the conversations, it's so compelling and his added commentary makes it so interesting. That's one of the reasons I love this book so much. Yes. And I just wanted to key off that phrase of like places being saved because of wine. I mean, I think that's the, you know, that's the key thing. I mean, to, you know, to me, Italy is unparalleled. I mean, it's got 545 grape varieties. <laughs> I mean, you can, it's got so much biodiversity. Part of it is because it was never, it never consolidated in the same way that it did in Spain and France. So the average 
uh, vineyard size is, um, is about uh, five acres. You know, in France, it's like 25. And, um, you know, in, other, in the New World, it's a lot bigger. Um, and so because of that, you've got a lot of differentiation. And I think with climate change, it's super interesting because there's a lot of stock of biodiversity there, um, you know, for people to go back and look at. But I just think there's so many, so many great areas there that are just, that have everything and are just, you know, waiting for people to come in and, you know, put more care. <laughs> and uh, undiscovered. yeah, undiscovered. I mean, it's happening. It started to happen. I mean, Etna has an image that people can relate to. You know, they think, ah. Oh, there, you know, there's the volcano, there's moon, you have the ocean, so, I mean, the sea. So, you know, maybe that's more compelling. There's parts of Tuscany that people think, oh, Tuscany, you know, the hills, Florence, and blah, blah, blah. But there's many, many other um, beautiful areas that have these. And you touch upon quite them. a few through your travels. Yeah. Yes. The Amalfi Coast. Yeah. Umbria. And um, and speaking of the relationships, one of the biggest that's covered in the book is wine and food. I mean, he's always eating with these people and always drinking. And it's like, oh, we had this for dinner and we talked this conversation and then we have plans for lunch now and then we're going to go off and do this. Then there's going to be an espresso before we go back and have dinner. And I'm <laughs> looking at him going, how do, <laughs> how do you stay so thin? Because he's always eating in this book. Well, I think, too, I mean, one of the beautiful things about Italy is, I mean, you travel, you know, 50, you know, uh, 50 miles, you're in a different culture, different wine zone, different recipes, you know, sometimes different dialects. And uh, it's a whole different experience and different cultures and different layers of that, you know, sort of cultural lasagna, you know, that is Italy. I mean, you could be in the Middle Ages, you can stumble upon a temple of Hercules, you know, and... Uh, and, uh, you know, with the food and the wine, like the Italians like to say, it's an emotion. And sometimes mm -hmm. when they drink wine, they go, this is an emotion, you know? And with the food, it's an emotion, you know? And it is. And the one character was trying to pr prove to you his wine was good, and I, when you would take a bite, he'd say, you see? You see? Yeah. Yes, It yes. works. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, there was, you know, I think that's to prove the point that many of these, um, I would say more rustic Italian varieties, they, they have a sort of bitterness that when you drink them alone, they're not necessarily that pleasant. Look, even Sangiovese, I mean, you know, you don't drink a glass of, you know, um, Chianti like that, I don't think. <laughs> but with food, you know, you put some salumi next to it or, you know, it, it, and it creates a something, you know, an alchemy that is greater than just the wine and the food. It just creates this mm -hmm. sort of magic. My wife was asking me if uh, there are recipes and photos in the book, and there are some wonderful black and white photos of these characters, and you, you often catch them in the middle of talking, so there's a lot of, and, <laughs> and a lot of this, these, these poses in black and white, which are fantastic, but there are no recipes, but he talks so much about what's involved with the meal that he's having. You could certainly recreate it if you wanted to, if you had the right elements around. Yeah. Ingredients. Yes, yes. Well, what is also, I mean, what's so interesting about Italian cuisine, it's a, you know, uh, cucina povera from, of, you know, based on what was available. And for a lot of the South, you know, that, that meant, um, you know, a lack of meat or a lack of good cuts of meat. So you know, they filled that in with these incredible recipes, like even like eggplant parmigiana. I mean, what a, you know, spectacular, filling, magical thing. Yeah, and like cacio and pepe, uh, you know, which is just um, cheese, pasta, pepper, and the pasta water. But it's the way they put that pasta water in, you know, and mix it in that creates you know, again, an alchemy that's greater. My grandmother used to uh, make in her little apartment in New York that was about this big, um, a pasta genovese, which is another Neapolitan dish, by the way, that it has a genovese name. I don't know why, but the genovese, you know, they were everywhere from 
Genoa. <laughs> they sailed a lot, but um, but it was all these awful cuts of offal and meat, and you know, they went in there. But you know, you sim they simmer them down with the onions and these spices and a little wine or whatever she put in there, and it it just became this, you know, the you know the most satisfying thing. You know, and, uh, you know I, I like to say that you know many foods you taste and. You smell, but I mean, for, for me, pasta is the one dish you, I, when it's made by a Nona, I taste it with my heart, I have mm. to say. Right. <laughs> there were times when I'd be reading the book in bed, hours after dinner, and I'd be reading about these dinners, and I'm like, I'm starting to get full again. You know, just <laughs> reading about all this pasta and everything that they were having. And I'm not joking. I was like, hmm, that's weird. Uh, in your last chapter, Return to Vico Equense, uh, you have a chance encounter with yet another character, and he's a, a local cousin, uh, Vittorio, who lives a poor life but uh, expressed his happiness nonetheless. Yes, yes. Um, he's actually my mother's cousin, so I knew him. He's a, uh, like a tailor, you know, old school Neapolitan tailor. Like, for example, when the local um, church like has statues and they want to put them in you know for you know the garments he even sews all of that with such detail and but yeah he was saying look you know i'm i'm poor but i live like a wealthy person you know and because vico equenze is known for its incredible food both for its pizza and uh some of the uh, most famous michelin star chefs um, in Italy come from uh, this town of Vigo Equense. I don't know what it is. It might be that it extends from the sea uh, up into these kind of very cool uh, uh, mountains that are topped with like chestnut groves and this kind of thing. So it's got everything from the sea to, you know, chestnuts and mushrooms. And, and uh, yeah, he was saying that uh, he makes, uh, his pension is 500 a month. And, uh, you know, I think like the, uh, you know, the rent is- uh, It's like, was it 400? 400. His expenses are 100. But after that, you know, he has tons of work, you know, that he, out of his, you know, apartment, you know, because he's like one of the last of these old Italian Craftsmen. I mean, the Neapolitan tailors are just amazing. I mean, when you you know talk about you know the way they just you know the way they would see like a jacket or you know and the wrinkles and how it has to you know hold perfectly. So anyway, he goes. You know, I have three. You know, I have three doctors. You know, one for my elbow, one for my heart. You know, these are all his customers. He so when he needs them, properly. you know, he goes, you know, to, you know, he has the doctors. And he said he, he even had a, a colonel in, um, in Italy, it's called the Guardia di Finanza, uh, which is like, you know, the IRS, but they go around in uniforms and they take pictures of the, like, the yachts and the Ferraris to figure out who's hiding money, right? Because, you know, tax, you know, unfortunately, you know, tax evasion is a great sport in Italy. So. Uh, but he even has one of these guys paying him cash for his suits <laughs> because, you know, nice. he's... Uh, nice. So... Uh, There's one thing he did, too, that was interesting when you, uh, ha after you finished dinner with him, the second night, I think, you were there two nights, he talked to you into coming back. He poured his wine in a glass with, a, was it peaches? Yeah. And you're like, what are you doing? And it was your dessert that you were Yeah, yeah, later. yeah. He goes, oh, this is great. You got to try this. You know, so this wine I brought from the Amalfi goes, he goes, take the wine, you go like this, you put it in the peaches. And, and he put it in the fridge for a while to yeah, chill. Yeah, put it in the fridge for a while, dessert, fine. And you was, said it was yeah, better yeah. than you expected. Yeah, and then he brought out his nocino. You know, it's a liquor that they make with a pick the um, green nuts. The walnuts. Yeah, walnuts. Um, you know, at a certain feast day, leave them in the bottle, and you know, so it's all those little recipes that make yeah. uh, you know it's richness of that makes the book so interesting. Speaking of wine, uh, you brought a couple from that you wanted to 
we put on display here. You want to explain what these are? Sure. Uh, are we going to open some of them? Well, I mean, these are some of the ones we had at some of the events. What I really like about Cento Passi is this is a, um, this is a wine label uh, by, from Sicily by a group. Uh, the uh, parent group is called Libera Terra. And it was founded by a um, Catholic priest and a, um, a uh, sociology professor in Milano whose f uh, father was assassinated in some mafia mix-up. And, um, and the idea of Cento Pazzi is it's a uh, sort of nonprofit social uh, cooperative where they take um, the lands that were confiscated from these mafia bosses, huh. and they could be, and they put them to use in a, in a social way. And uh, part of that is that, like the, like, from what I understand, like mafiosi, and it's from, it's based right around Corleone, you know, the famous Corleone. But uh, you know, part of the reason is that when these mafia guys would mafia bosses would go off to prison, they didn't want the land to lay fallow because that would send a bad message to the population. You know, they would look at it and they would say, look, you know, at least with the mafia, we had jobs, we had, you know. So this way, it's putting it to, you know, to some kind of use. And also, I have to say, the wine is damn well good. They're <laughs> planted on nice slopes. They've gotten some um, talented um, winemakers. Um, you know, to work with them. And uh, they've also used it to, you know, train some of these local people who are unemployed in viticulture. That's great. So once again, you know, the world being saved by, you know, the pieces of the world being saved by wine. Hmm. So, uh, you, know, I, you know, it's a beautiful project and it's nice too because they're sold at price points that are like, very affordable, and it's a cooperative nonprofit and all that. And the other one is from um, uh, Alianico, is a big grape that I think has a lot of potential in southern Italy. It's grown in Campania and in Basilicata. And this one is um, uh, produced uh, in uh, Vulture, Alianico de Vulture, which to me is an exciting area. Uh, partly because there's a group of young uh, producers there called Generazione Vulture that all get together, they talk, there's about you know, uh, 10 of them. Uh, they drink gin and tonics together, they go out to eat, they converse, and they're all into, let's say, um, a more balanced style of wine. I think for many of the generation before, they wanted something big or heavy, it was one of the uh, characters in the book says something you had to eat with a, you know, you had to drink while you ate a brontosaurus steak, you know. Hmm. So I think, you know, that's another case of generational change moving forward, um, you know, with a good message. And the brothers who do this, they're originally from Tuscany. Their, their parents were part of that Tuscan wave of, uh, maybe in the 80s, and uh, you know, they sold that reality and invested in Basilicata. And Basilicata is just one of these hidden places at the very bottom of the instep of the boot of Italy. And there they always complain. They say, there's more, um, Italians don't know where Basilicata is. There's more people in California that no, and I think there was, in Southern California, there was a big immigration at one point, uh, I think around San Diego or something like that, which is, a, you know, which... Uh, <laughs> That's uh, yeah. one, of the, one of the many regions that you visited and you talk about in, in the book. Yes, yeah. Um, well, you know, we have some of this wine open, so I think we should probably uh, maybe make our way over to that table here yeah. in a second. Great. Anything else you want to mention? No, uh, that's it. I want to point out that uh, we mentioned earlier that Robert uh, writes for the Wine Spectator and he has a twice monthly column called Robert Camuto Meets, yeah. where he's meeting these interesting characters 
much shorter level, but very much like he writes about in the book. So those are just as fascinating yeah. to read yeah, online. That's winespectator.com. Right. And I would say the other surprise that I've had, in, uh, it's been quite a while since I've been in an American library. And you talk about terroir. I just love the smell of the books, I have to say. <laughs> I love the smell of the books and even like things like the water fountain, you know, it reminds me of my childhood. So. It's nice to be in a library. You don't with, see many water fountains. And you don't see many libraries with a vineyard behind it either. Yeah. So that's, that's a nice that's backdrop. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for watching. I'm Jeff Davis with the Napa Valley Wine Library Association. We'll see you next time.